Thank you. So I'm going to give us a brief update on some of the serology work we've been doing for the past couple of years. I guess I think in the last meeting I introduced some of these concepts, so I'm not going to go through everything, but give a, a small update on some new developments. So I guess that the premise of all of this work is thinking about how we count cholera, cholera cases or how we characterize cholera transmission. Um, in, we have many uses for it you know, here and in public health departments as well in terms of characterizing risk, in terms of measuring how well different interventions work, and just understanding the epidemiology of disease so, uh, or of, of the path of, of cholera in general. Um, and so to do any of these things, we need to be able to quantify how many cases or quantify transmission. And, and we struggle with that because... Uh, both because of the natural history of cholera and also because of our surveillance systems. So uh, just as an illustration, uh, you know, we may have 100 people infected with cholera. Only a, a very small proportion of those people are actually symptomatic. And even a smaller proportion are severely symptomatic to the point where they'll actually seek care. And then they may, some of them may show up at a health center, and some of those people may be actually reported. And so what we actually see and actually detect, report it as cholera. So what we see here, um, maybe these two cases out of 100 infections, is just the, the tip of the iceberg. And it's very hard to, um, to work with clinical cases only. And it may give a distorted picture of reality, especially when there's, there's no lab confirmation, as, as Anton just um, talked about. And so a few years ago, uh, we started thinking about how, how um, antibody signatures in blood may give us some insight that's, that's um, parallel or, or somewhat independent of, of um, surveillance systems in countries. We know that when someone's infected with Vibrio cholera, they mount an immune response to multiple different an antigens, um, which then decays. And we thought, whether, we asked ourselves whether we can exploit um, our understanding of these antibody kinetics to estimate or identify people who have been recently infected. And so like the, the first, I guess, product of this work, what I presented here last year, um, was recently published. And basically, we showed that um, using, using data from Bangladesh and also North American volunteers who had never seen cholera before, um, that cross-sectional profiles of people's of a panel of different antibodies can do a really good job identifying whether someone was infected in the last year or not. And so we took this, this model and to, to Bangladesh where we conducted a nationally representative sero survey. Um, Dr. Ashraf presented a couple of days ago um, the picture of, of cholera in Bangladesh. And I think it's, it's only really this year that we are starting to, Bangladesh is a, this, this home of cholera, that we've been studying cholera for many years. And it's only this year that we've really started to have a more refined picture of where, how much in, in the country. And so um, we wanted to understand in a, in a way that was independent from um, the surveillance systems, what cholera transmission looks like in Bangladesh, how much heterogeneity is there across the country, where do we see more, where do we see less. So we conducted this nationally representative sero survey where we sampled uh, close to 3,000 people randomly nationally um, at the end of, of 2016, or the beginning of 2016, and we tested each um, sample for a, a suite of different antibodies, and including the vibriocidal test, which is a, a functional assay um, that measures a, a whole bunch of different antibody activity. And so what we found was that um, the, so the colors here represent the proportion we estimate to have been infected in the last year. Um, and when I say infected, we're not talking about becoming a cholera case. As, we, as I showed before, uh, only a small fraction of people who are infected actually become cholera cases. And so these are the proportion of people who were infected in the last year, and it ranged quite dramatically from basically no one to as high as 60% in, in some places. And um, this is just an illustration of how representative our sample was in terms of um, 
age distribution and, and sex. Um, we, did, we did under sample the young kids. It's hard to get blood from young kids. Um, so keep that in mind. And we see that in young kids, this is the age distribution of positivity. But um, younger kids, obviously, they've lived in a color endemic place for less time. Um, so they have less of a chance to have been exposed. And so we see, particularly in the, in the small, the 0 to 3 and 3 to 5 is pretty low uh, seroprevalence. And so this, with this survey, this also gives us an opportunity to look at risk factors for cholera infection in a, in a way, in a, in a new way. Because um, we have this over the, over the entire country, we have these data. And then we have information about the individuals. We have information about the households. And then we also have information on the communities. And so what we found was that, um, as more or less as I showed here in, in B, that age is, as you get older, um, particularly compared to under 10-year-olds, you have a higher risk of having been recently infected. We see that females, so this line right here represents kind of no association. Um, things above this line represent positive association, more risk, below, less risk, with the dark lines in each of these distributions representing the, the median. Uh, we see that females our males are at less risk, so females are significantly uh, more likely to have been infected recently. And we see some indication that being uh, wealthier is associated with, as, as we expect, um, not being infected. Uh, it's not, nothing is really significant, and we don't see any indication that um, travel, in the, you know, whether in the last week, last month, or last six months, is, is predictive of uh, risk. So, so nothing, nothing much really pops out um, from this except for the for male, female, I think, for me. Um, <clears throat> so we, we could then take these estimates, use some different covariates, um, which don't add that much information, so things like travel time, poverty index, and create these smooth maps of, of cholera incidents, uh, of infection incidents across the country, or here I'm presenting it as relative risk. So places that are in red are at higher risk throughout the country. Places that are in blue are lower risk. The, this is not showing the absolute risk. This is just the relative risk. So we see um, down in the delta quite a, a high risk of having been recently infected. Um, here in the west on, on, the, on the border with India, um, I guess also on the border of India here, and then a little patch here, and then in, in uh, Cox's Bazaar and Chittagong. And I think in terms of public health relevance, relative risk is only one measure. We can then take this map and multiply it by the population in each one of these small areas and think about how many actual infections occur. And this, this right here is DACA. And so you can see DACA on this map is not that red, but there are a lot of people living there. And so when you start thinking about the number of cases and the number of infections, um, you start to see the highly populated areas, even if they're not at significantly higher risk than other places, have a lot of infections. So you have Cox's Bazaar and, and DACA here. Um, and, and our preliminary estimates suggest that there's, there's about 20 something million, 20 million or so infections a year. Um, I'm, I'm not sure. I, I, I would say preliminary estimates. Um, and so I guess the, the one, one question this raises is how, how this relates to cases. Because what we care about is, is public health and, and saving people from actually having cholera disease. Um, and so we know that when we make these maps based on clinical cases, um, as Ashraf presented, that they're you know, these are estimates also that have plenty of biases, and we don't necessarily expect them to fully align because of differences in healthcare-seeking behavior and other, other biases that might be context-dependent. But I think it's really important to start thinking about how this relates to this and how we can, we can do cross-sectional serology and cross-sectional seroserveys, but what we want to do is be able to translate this map into something that's public health relevant and clinically relevant. And so we're exploring, trying to understand the relationships between this and this. Um, 
and, and what you see here is generally things look similar. There's a few big exceptions like right here and here. Um, and these are driven, the, this, this district and this district are driven by very, very high reported acute watery diarrhea cases during this period. And so, um, and yeah, we, we don't really understand why it could have been an outbreak of another, um, another pathogen. And so I, I, I think I'll leave it there. I guess looking forward, we're, we're working on refining these models to do a better job at, at identifying recent infections, trying to simplify the antibody panel. Right now, uh, we, we do require a, a, bunch of, a bunch of antibodies to be tested for. Um, and also looking for new markers that may identify infections over different time windows and may help us discriminate more recent versus uh, less recent infections. And then as we move into an era of um, having partially vaccinated populations, we know that when you take the vaccine, you have an immune response. And so we're working on methods to, to separate people who have been vaccinated versus people who have seen the, the actual uh, live bug. Um, and then also working on some guidance for sero survey design and sample size. At some point, um, if we want to use serology for kind of monitoring progress um, on the road to elimination, there becomes some incidence level that below which you would need a, an impractical sample size to actually say much. And so we're, we're trying to explore what these, these limits might be and give some, some sort of guidance to, to allow people to move forward with these methods. So that's all I have. Thanks, Anton.